today we're going to be talking about exchange traded funds because they're a key and growing part of the business. Today is the first of a two-parter on ETFs. So if securities lending and securities finance is part of your interest, whether you're working in it, whether you're part of it, a contributor, or you're just plain interested like retail investors should be, then this is the place for you. So let's get started. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to uh, another Securities Lending Saturday. Thanks very much for joining me. Today, as I said, I'm going to be talking about exchange-traded funds. This is the first in two parts. I thought I'd be able to cover it in one piece on its own. That's not possible because I got a bunch of questions from people that wanted a little bit of the basics behind it before we delved right into securities lending and how it ties into um ETF specifically. So that's what we're going to do today is lay a little bit of groundwork for the show next week, <clears throat> which will be part two, and we'll specifically be talking about securities lending. As always, I have a slide deck. I'm sure you'd be surprised at that or not. Anyway, here it is. We are looking at week 42 this week out of the past to the past year, not quite a year yet. We're coming up to that. Who knows what we'll do for a celebration. Any ideas, uh, give me a shout. Next week, as I said, we'll be focused more on securities lending and ETF specifically. So this is a little bit of uh, a benchmark about ETFs. So if you already know about ETFs, maybe you don't want to be part of this, or maybe you just want to see some of the more current stats that I've been able to dig up and get my own perspective on ETFs. Either way, thanks for being with me so far. This is what we'll be talking about today. So we're just talking about what the definition of an ETF is. We'll be giving you things to think about when you're considering the different aspects of ETFs, how you would also compare them. Just a really brief overview on the relative relevance to securities lending, some stats on the ETFs and uh, assets under management. Then we'll be focusing on some key trends and why they're actually important for the future. And then I'm just going to do the final piece which is a which is about two market participants. Sorry for laughing, Sala. Thanks very much for your uh, kind comments. He says that maybe I should actually uh, record a song on it. It could be a big hit, but only if I get someone else to sing it. My singing voice is often mistaken for the dulcet tones of Bob Dylan. So if you like Bob Dylan, maybe that'll work. I like to mumble, and I'm off key. Not saying he is, but but there you go. I certainly am. Okay, so thanks for that. The idea behind this pool, right? First of all, it reminds me of being in Hong Kong and many hotels in Asia and maybe elsewhere. But the pool is relevant because, I'll come back to that in a second, because the definition of an ETF is that it's a pooled investment security, right? So it's pooling together multiple investors into a single unit. And so in many ways, it's like a mutual fund. And as it says here, it can track a particular index or a sector or asset types. But the difference between an ETF and a mutual fund or a USIT is that ETFs are bought and sold on exchange, just any stocks are, right? So that's the difference. You can create and you can redeem uh, ETFs. So they are, in that sense, they're an open-ended fund because the number of units can expand or shrink depending on investor interest. And so in, in that way, it's like a mutual fund, but the way that you can trade it as typically as a retail investor, you can't really be creating and redeeming any assets. So you're trading always on the secondary market and you're get, getting someone to deliver those assets to you. They may have to go into the primary market and create it, but we'll get into that in a minute. <clears throat> the one thing I really want to stress here is that th this point here, the first ETF was the, the SPY, the Spider S&P 500, uh, which is managed by State Street and it tracks S&P 500 as the name says. And it says that it's an actively traded e ETF today. That's what, that's the definition from Investopedia. 
I, I want you to know that's true that it's an actively traded ETF, but this particular instrument is in fact the typically the highest turnover stock anywhere in the world on a given day. So just giving an example, this is from investing.com. This is their data from yesterday, the most active traders and most active traded entities on the US exchange. And the US is, is probably the, uh, not probably, but it is the highest turnover market. And so the biggest stock yesterday was Tesla. It traded about uh, $20 billion, $21 billion yesterday. On that same day, yesterday, the S&P 500, the SPY, it traded 34.8 bill. So that just gives you an idea of the relative scale of this. So when you're thinking about liquidity of ETFs, and we'll talk about this more next week, there are just so many different ways to look at true liquidity. And a reason I included this bottom chart here was just to show you that this 34, almost 35 billion was a relatively light turnover day. There's many more. In fact, that's a, one of the lightest we've seen in, uh, in, in quite some time. So <clears throat> look, the reality is these are incredibly actively traded, some of them, right? So the SPY is the biggest, not every fund obviously is, is that big. So just get some perspective here. So that's turnover. Um, we're going to talk a little bit now about really how ETFs differentiate themselves so that when you're looking at ETFs, you can understand a little bit more about them. So first of all, uh, they represent, as it says, many different asset types. So equities are how they started, but you get many uh, fixed income bond uh, ETFs. They're constructed a little bit differently. I'm not sure if I'm going to talk about that next week or not, but whereas equities might track an index and they might be fully replicating where they hold everything in the index, or they might be optimized where there's a subset of the index, bonds really often target the yield from the index that they're trying to track rather than necessarily the specific assets. Of course, some of them, the money market uh, funds, they will hold the appropriate assets in there, but so you really need to dig beyond so the headline of what type of a fund it is. Uh, commodities, very big, gold, oil, clearly that's been a, a strong point for ETFs historically. But you also get currencies, currency ETFs, and then specialty ETFs. What I mean by specialty ETFs are things like inverse ETFs. So an inverse ETF is something that a, an inverse S&P 500 would say that if the S&P 500 goes up, today by 5%, you would actually uh, lose 5% today and vice versa. So if the S&P dropped, you would have a gain on that. Or you get leveraged ETFs where through the use of derivatives, you're not just getting one time the performance, you might be getting two times or, or three times the performance. So again, if the S&P goes up 5%, you're getting 10% or 15% and the same on the downside, you're losing multiples of the daily market performance. So there are, there are these sort of uniquely structured ETFs as well. There's different categories. So you could have them from developed funds or emerging developed markets, emerging markets, frontier markets. So there's different categories there. They're often regionally focused. So I put up Europe and Asia, but it could really be any region. You get also specific country ETF. So you can be very specific in, in which country you want to get exposure in. And, and all of these things are what make it easier or particularly attractive to retail investors who might say they want exposure to a given country or a different, uh, a specific sector. They think it's going to be a great year for frontier markets. So they want to go into that market, or they think that right now with everything going on in the world, commodity ETFs must be a great play. So I'll get into commodity ETFs and either I can have a broad basket of commodities or a very specific targeted class, maybe like oil at the moment. And the country ones, as I said, you know, so did Japan, China, but literally there's numerous country specific ones where you can select the countries that you think will be doing well. Then you get sectors and, uh, People often confuse sectors with themes. Sectors are really an official, an official category. So uh, there's, I think the, the GIC, the global industry classification system and numbering system that 
that identifies companies so that you can gather them up and compare them within sectors and subsets of those sectors. I think there's 11 of those. Two of the examples I give you would be information technology and finance. If I skip capitalization and go to thematic, people confuse sometimes thematic with sector. <clears throat> so an example of it might be the ARC ETF that's run by Kathy Woods. So that's thematic even though her target is disruptive innovation, and that might have many technology companies in it, but information technology is a specific sector. And so all of the companies in an ETF on an information technology focused ETF would have to be in the information technology sector, whereas <clears throat> something thematic could really be any kind of disruptive innovation. So it's much broader and it's also longer term if you want to think of it in that, that sense. It's much more about as it says, themes, trends, that kind of thing, rather than specific sectors. And an example, again, relevant to these days, unfortunately, would be say the defense sector. The defense sector isn't really a sector. It's a subset, uh, I think, of capital goods, which is a subset of, of a broader category, which is, I think, capital. So <clears throat> you have capital goods that goes into another segment, which goes into another subsegment where you'd find defense. So you can find defense targeted ETFs, I'm sure, but that wouldn't necessarily in and of itself be a theme. Okay. Hope you appreciate the subtleties. And then going back to the other one, the capitalization, you might have a large cap focus. You might have a mid cap focus. You might have a small cap or a micro cap uh, focus. So really it's the combination of all of these things that go into really the profile of any given ETF. I hope that all makes sense. Nilesh, hello, and welcome back again. Thanks for joining. Now, when you as an investor are looking at different ETFs, you want to figure out how you're going to compare these. And so you might look at some of these things. Again, the uh, inspiration and the uh, identification for all this came from Track Insight. Uh, they've got some fantastic educational material on their site. So I would recommend that if you want to learn more about ETFs, I recommend that you go there. So you want to be looking, is it passively managed? So is it really tracking an index? Is it just trying to replicate that index either in whole or in part, or is it an actively managed one? And I'll talk about active management in a moment, but that's really the difference. Passive management versus active management. You can get ETFs that cover both. Then you want to look at the holdings. As I said before, you need to understand what the underlying assets are. Is it an ETF that if it's an S&P 500, does it hold all 500 ETFs or does it hold 80% of that so that they save some of the expenses of holding all of the positions? Or maybe they optimize and they say, look, if we hold these 10 stocks out of a 30 stock index, that gives us 90% of the performance and we're okay with that. The reason you have to understand that focus is because it gives you an idea of how likely it to have a risk of straying from the index performance that it's tracking. If it's replicating everything hundred percent, we'd expect it to track pretty close to hundred percent less expenses. But if there's a divergence in the holdings compared to the index that they're tracking, then clearly there's an opportunity to outperform or underperform. And you should understand that before making any decisions. Of course, let me say again, none of this is investment advice. Always speak to a professional before doing anything in markets because you'd be crazy not to, and you'd be crazier listening to me. Uh, you want to look at concentration limits again, but they, you want to look at those underlying holdings and see how big maybe their top 10 holdings are as part of the overall index, because that will determine the performance. Even if the outliers below that outperform uh, or underperform it may not have that much of an impact on the overall fund if it's very concentrated. Again, if you look at the ARC uh, ETF that I talked about, it's had a pretty, pretty large concentration in Tesla, uh, for example, and that's good at times and that's not so good at other times. These next two items, performance and total expense ratios, really tie into securities lending. If you just hold on one sec, my throat is about to give up. Okay, I'm back. Thanks for that. The performance of an ETF, right? So one of the things that you want to look at is if there are two ETFs that you're considering buying and one has 
better performance than the other, maybe you're going to opt for that one. Maybe that's a better manager or the construction of that ETF is more effective in delivering the performance you're looking for. The other part of the flip side of that, of course, is the total expense ratios. How much does it cost for that fund to be paying for the custodians and all of the infrastructure and the expense and any administration and management and all of that? Many funds will compete based on the expense ratios and securities lending fees and revenues that they get go into both the performance or the total expense ratio, depending on the policy of uh, the investment manager. And so you need to understand that going in. But again, I'll talk about securities lending participation next week in more detail, as well as, as well as liquidity, which I want to, I want to explore in more depth than I can do today. Now, because it's like a stock, you can still look at the other, the other components as you would with any other stock. So uh, I won't really talk about those, but increasingly, let me just make a point. Investors are looking at sort of the sustainability and ESG credentials of ETFs. Again, one of the things that really got me really riled up about ETFs and the whole ESG movement is you need to be very clear about whether the ESG labeled ETF that you are buying or considering buying really is genuinely an ESG focused one. On my blog posts, maybe I'll put a link in the show notes, but I wrote a blog post about an ETF I read about where it said, we're launching a brand new ETF. It's ESG focused. And at any time, this fund will be 80% invested, at least 80% invested in the target ESG index we're tracking. And I thought that's certainly one way of looking at it. The other way of looking at it is what you're really saying is at any point in time, it could be 20% not invested in ESG stocks from that index is tracking, which I found really strange because if I'm buying an ESG ETF, I'd want it to be hundred percent ESG. So they gave themselves a carve out, but again, it was, they weren't hiding that. That was very clear at the start. They saying, this is how we track it. So I don't have an issue with that as such. The other thing they did was they put a carve out again, they disclosed this, uh, a carve out that it excluded securities lending collateral, right? So you lend out the securities, uh, you may take cash and that cash might be uh, invested in who knows what, or you might take securities. And again, unless you stipulate it, <clears throat> it might be a broad range of securities that you're taking. And what might be done with that cash is it might go into non ESG companies, commercial paper, for instance, an oil company, commercial paper for an, or it may hold the stocks from that same company as collateral or a corporate bond from that company. So it would be that fund could end up holding an asset that they would never be able to buy outright, which sounds to me like strange. And if you estimate that at the peak, let's say that ETF 20% of the underlying assets on loan. It could be with 20% not invested in the index and 20% of theoretically potentially non-ESG collateral, you could have an ESG fund that you're paying management fees on that's only 60% invested in ETF, uh, in ESG assets. Sounds really strange to me. So always dig down on any of these factors to make certain that you understand what the component assets are that you are buying and what that actually means relative to your investment philosophy or objectives. All right, just very quickly, I'm not going to go into any detail, but look, why is, why are ETFs relevant to securities lending? Because they represent a big proportion of this green area. This chart is taken from the Isla Securities Lending Market Report, which was released a couple of weeks ago. And collective investment vehicles include mutual funds usage uh, and ETFs are a big portion of that. So this is the third largest sector by assets on loan. I think it's also the largest sector by assets available, right? So it's pretty important as a sector and ETFs are a big part of that overall sector and growing. And I'll come back to that when I get to trend. So look, it's just big. That's the bottom line. It represents a huge proportion of the assets that are on loan today. 
And when we look at ETFs, if you think of layers, there's two different ways to look at ETFs and securities lending. There's ETFs that shares in their own right. So people go long these assets, people can go short these assets, and that doesn't really show up in, in, in this kind of data in that way. So an ETF that's on loan isn't going to affect this category because it'll be bought by an end investor and that end investor lends it out and it might be included in any of these other sectors. So there's the ETF themselves as a share in the same way that Tesla is a share and they can be, you can go long or you can go short those. Uh, and then of course, where this chart where this data comes from in terms of the proportion on loan that really rely that relates to the underlying assets held within the ETF. Okay. So two layers, one is the ETFs themselves. The other is the underlying assets of each of the ETFs that are in lending programs. And we'll talk about both of those next week. Uh, some stats on uh, assets under management. Look, the ETF GI, again, I would recommend that you go to ETF GI. They are the definitive source for all ETF uh, related insights uh, and data. So definitely recommend you go there, but look at this chart. So really this is tracks essentially the last 20 years. You can see in the bars are the ETF assets. All right. And then there's a, an ETP. So sometimes people see ETFs and ETPs. ETFs are exchange-traded funds. ETPs are exchange-traded products. There's a difference in terms of their structure and what they mean from a risk profile as well. So I haven't got into that today. Maybe I will next week, just so you know the difference. But you can see that overwhelmingly we're talking about ETFs anyway. So we won't really touch on that too much, but the, the line chart, the line bits talk about the number of funds. So you can see that there's whatever that is about 8,000, 9,000 actual ET and whatever that is, maybe 2000 exchange traded uh, products. So quite a lot of funds, but it's the bar chart here. We're talking about $10 trillion of ETFs under management. Okay. And dr you can see just dramatically growing. And that, that was even a, a strong performance over the last few years as well, despite any lockdowns and, and that kind of thing. So pretty strong growth and relentless. If you talk about regions, the regions that you have here, this chart, if we look at some of the key trends, the pink bit talks about all exchange traded products. So that includes exchange traded funds and exchange traded products, but you can see how overall you're talking about them representing about $10 trillion of assets. These are the other regulated open-ended funds. So mutual funds and usits. Uh, so you can see it's pretty good penetration in the U S much less penetration in, in and a, a similar penetration in Asia. So you can see it's really, although it's active in each of the areas, there's still a lot of growth. And this kind of pace of growth will mean that those, that those pink bits get a little bit bigger every year. Okay. So let's talk about some of the trends. I've talked about the growth of the assets under management and that's continuous. One of the really interesting trends that I want to see if it continues, is, particularly in the U S there's a trend to switching from mutual funds to ETFs. And I've just given you an example. JP Morgan announced a few months ago that from April, uh, 2022, they'll be switching four of their funds with about $10 billion under management from mutual funds into ETF. Look, there's lots of reasons why you might do that structurally. There's you know, sometimes there can be a tax advantage, particularly in the U S but Brown brothers, Harriman has put together a really good guide to the things to think about when switching. Here's a link here, which I've set up, which was much, much smaller than the, than the, the URL, but it's basically BBH ETFs and uh, uh, mutual funds, MFs. So if you go there, you can see it. It's a great, it's a great description of the considerations. One of the hottest trends that will be coming out and uh, maybe the next slide I've messed up. So. I'll explore that with you, <laughs> but, uh, or discover it with you. There's been a tremendous growth of active management. Now ETFs have their history in passively replicating indexes. You have passive 
sounds pejorative, but the idea is you only need to trade when you need to trade, when there's a change in constituent elements to the, to the underlying index. Therefore, it reduces the costs. So you get lots of investors pooling their money together, buying the ETF, very little turnover, and that helps keep costs low. Of course, passive doesn't mean you don't change anything. There is, of course, trading activity based on inflows and outflows and also constituent changes. And a, a really good description is that passive management is really just slow active management because there are changes over time. But active management is much more being stock specific or being assets specific in terms of selecting it. So rather than being tied to an index, it's a more proprietary decision-making process by the investment manager. So they're trying to demonstrate their ability to choose assets that will outperform. So active is, is exactly that. They're actively looking at improving the performance rather than passively following index constructions. But the challenge has always been, how do you take this kind of active management activity and put it into a wrapper to make it more accessible to people, but still have enough transparency so that people can still go through all of the considerations that I talked about so that the market makers and authorized participants who I'll come to in a minute so that they can actually understand the components there so that they can help provide liquidity so that they have opportunities to make arbitrage profits, to rectify any mispricings in the market. So it's been a challenge, but there has definitely been pretty dramatic growth. And it's a trend that I think will not only continue to grow, but will expand globally. So I'll show you a chart. Hopefully I'll show you a chart in a minute. As I said, we'll discover that again uh, together in a moment. And then the final part here, as far as an important trend, I constantly come back to this idea about retail investor participation in securities lending programs through fully paid products from their broker dealers that service them. Many retail investors are holders of ETFs. And so this really helps deepen the pool and widen the pool of assets that are actually available. So I think that's a, a key trend. And again, we'll touch on that next week. All right, now let's see what this next slide slows. Do you know what I have? Oh, do you know what it? Do you know what it is? I have a nut. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna take this slide off for a second. All right, and then I'm magically gonna make this chart disappear. I think because I don't know if you can see it, but just hiding behind here, there is another. There is another graph. So hold on one second. We'll do some off-screen magic. I will go to the PowerPoint. Hold on. I will not go to the PowerPoint. Just a second here. Hold on a second. This is doing work on the fly. We are going to magically make a chart. If I can ever get the right one. Hold on a sec. Almost there. The reason I want to show you this is because it is a really super important trend. Otherwise, I wouldn't be wasting your time with it. Okay, so hold on a sec. We're just going to put this up, hopefully. Okay, now that I've got that done, I am going to reshare the screen. Okay, so again, the same slide that we were just looking at, but what I have here is the growth in actively managed assets. So you can see that this kind of wrapper, ETF wrapper around active management has really struggled over many years, but has dramatically taken off over the last few years, both in the number of ETFs, which is the line, the number of funds that are actively managed and the assets under management there. So now what this allows you to do as an investment manager is take some of your proprietary uh, trading strategies and your portfolio construction and make it available to a wider audience. Hopefully you'll be outperforming and it'll make it accessible for them, for investors to uh, be able to participate in your strategy, but without giving away you know, what the people at uh, Blue Tractor who are, are leaders in, in helping active managers come to market and protect this intellectual property. It, it, it's about helping them be able to bring their products to market and, and without giving away their secret sauce, 
as Blue describes it. So you can have this kind of proprietary uh, trading strategy, this portfolio construction there. You can offer it to customers, again, on, on an open-ended basis uh, with the ETF and allow it to trade in the secondary market. And if your strategy outperforms, your ETF should outperform. So I think this is a really fascinating uh, trend to watch. There's obviously a lot of complexity here in delivering these products to make them accessible yet still secret in that sense, but they benefit from all of the normal liquidity support that you get in the market. So it's quite an interesting thing and, and no doubt you'll see something, see more from uh, the market on that, but I'll try to bring you more in the future as well. Ali, thanks very much for joining. I, I agree that as he says here, and I just want to share that with you, Ali says active ETFs are the future. And I think they certainly, well, you can see from the asset growth that they're already becoming a big part of the future. So if we look at assets under management, not quite half a trillion dollars, 450 billion out of 10 billion, 10 trillion. So still very small, but at this kind of growth, I think you would, uh, you'd be, you'd be foolish not to pay attention to this. Now, this, these final two bars they look like they haven't really grown, like it's stalled. But we have to remember is that this 2021 figure is as at the year end, uh, and this is at the month end in February. So there's hardly been any growth. So you're always going to get market fluctuations and values that impact that, but that's, that is still growth. Okay. Hopefully that was worth all the messing around and getting the right active chart for you. This is something to watch. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna close off with comments about two of the key market participants here. One is authorized participants. So the description here is it's an organization that has the right to create and redeem shares of an exchange traded fund, uh, and this chart actually shows uh, shows quite a, a useful kind of flow here. If you think about it, what authorized participants do is they're the ones that either increase the supply of ETFs in the market that trade or they decrease the amount. And they do that by either creating new ETFs or redeeming ETFs. And they do that in response. They do that in response to whether there is an imbalance of people that want to buy or people that want to sell. So if there's more buyers of, of an ETF, then there are willing sellers in that market. It's possible to create a new ETF by the authorized participant either delivering <clears throat> the portfolio composition to the ETF issuer and say, here's the underlying, go create me a new ETF, or they can just give cash and the ETF issuer will create new shares. So all of a sudden there's investor demand for that. It exceeds the market supply. And so now you create additional ETFs, it gets delivered to them. In the same way that if you have more sellers, then there are buyers that redeem the excess proportion where they actually say, look, we're going to take these excess ETFs out of the market, get the underlying assets back and cash them in and take the, uh, take them out of the system. So they keep an equilibrium in that sense, in terms of the primary market, the number of ETF uh, shares in issue for each issue. So have a look at that. And then the second part is market makers. So market makers are the ones that are there on the exchanges or on OTC markets to make certain that there's enough fluidity between buyers and sellers. So there's always a buyer for a seller, always a seller for a buyer. Uh, market makers are really the key liquidity providers here. They keep the exchange activity oiled. And again, securities lending might actually come into the market as well here, where again, you have a buyer of an ETF and there's no sellers the market maker might choose to borrow those ETFs if they can source them and deliver that out because their own view is that it might be cheaper to buy in future or they might be able to create it. So we'll talk next week a little bit about arbitrage and how that fits into securities lending. But the market makers are really some of the key liquidity providers that keep the day-to-day -day flowing. Authorized participants, they increase, decrease the uh, units in, in float. Market makers keep the secondary market trading activity. They can be the same firm. Market makers and authorized participants can be the same firm, or they can only be an authorized participant 
or a market maker, some firms fill both roles. Again, more of this will become clear. Anything I've put in this uh, presentation with two asterisks, I'll be talking about more next week. Ali, as a proportion, how much of the market is active and passive by assets under management? I think if we look at it, you basically have, sorry, we have overall assets under management in all ETFs and exchange traded products is around $10 trillion. Okay. And although that's grown, so you can see it's gone up from effectively seven and a half to 10 from 2020 to today. We can also see in the active management in that same period, it's gone from effectively $280 billion to 450. So that's a pretty hefty increase. So the percentage there is basically 450 billion out of uh, 10 trillion. All right. It's still a very small proportion, but growing pretty fast. And again, there's, there are restrictions. For instance, right now in the US ETFs are only allowed to offer active management ETFs in securities that are effectively in the same time zone as the US. So they can do it for Canadian shares and US shares and Mexican and you know, some of the South American countries, but you can't have a US ETF doing European shares in an active management. So that's artificial constraint because there's nothing stopping them from doing that. It's more about SEC restrictions. So that's one of the other reasons why I think active management will continue to grow. So part of it is exposing markets and Asia to active management more actively, <laughs> if you excuse the phrase. And part of it is at some point, will those regulations change? I think it's likely that they will. Time will tell. Okay. Hope that answered the question sufficiently. It's an obvious question. I should have figured out the maths to it beforehand, but I didn't. So thanks for spotting that. Okay. Let's just do a quick wrap up uh, and I'll give you back your Saturday. Exchange traded funds are pooled investment funds that operate and trade like a stock. Otherwise it's similar to a mutual fund being open-ended. You can get very specific, really targeted at exactly what you're looking for. You can really narrow down or make it as wide as you like. ETFs offer a little bit of something for everyone. So it's very easy to find at least one ETF that hopefully will meet your requirements. There's lots of different things to think about when you are considering which ETF I've given you some of them, but always do your research securities lend and ETFs right now. It's a key part of the business, but I look, I think it will continue to evolve. Active management has all kinds of interesting sort of twists on it as well. So if active management comes into it, it it'll be an interesting adjunct and expansion of what we're already seeing. ETFs continuous growth and the key trends are part of that continuous growth. The switching from mutual funds to ETFs, let's see if that, that continues and also whether it expands beyond the US. The differences between a USIT and an ETF from say a tax perspective in Europe, I think there are fewer tax differentials. So there are fewer drivers to force that kind of, that kind of change. Ali, if you're still watching, I, I don't know if you have any thoughts in that, but the, the mutual fund versus ETF for us investors is, does have a, a, an advantage for many investors, I think is less clear cut from a pure tax point of view. There might be other issues, other reasons that are advantageous for switching, but we'll see active, ex active expansion. We've talked lots about and the retail investor participant participation is important. The two key market participants, of course, are the market maker and the authorized participants really doing that primary market activity, increasing, decreasing the overall supply in the market, the market makers doing the day-to-day uh, -day secondary market trading to make certain that everything is liquid. The other thing Ali points out is I didn't talk about physical and synthetics. So you can have ETFs that are backed by the physical assets, but you can also have them backed by derivatives and there are some structural differences and it's also changed over time. I have a podcast that I did with Manoj Mystery. I think I did it last year and he talks about some of the history and some of the challenges and struggles in that. So maybe I'll include a link to the uh, podcast for that. So thanks for the question, Ali. Okay. So look, that's it next week. 
We're going to be talking about more about ETFs and securities lending, the overlap and the interplay between the two. Hopefully that makes it one plus one. ETFs and securities lending, that's a match made in heaven, bringing love and money to all of the participants that are part of it. I hope you've uh, got some value out of this today. If Give me a thumbs up. And if you, if you haven't subscribed yet and you want to get future videos, don't forget to subscribe. But other than that, this is Roy Zimmerhansel. I'm your host. And I'm wishing you a great Saturday, a great weekend, a great week. And I hope to see you next week.